right? Secondly, um, it's only very recently that these incidents, of the, the swing has started to be recognised. If you go on to the next slide. Okay, this is two pictures I think are really funny, but well, certainly this one over here. Okay, this is a plaque which was put up in February this year in, in Salisbury where a lot of the trials for swing rioters were done. Okay, and um, it's supported by the trade unions, and we went down. It's probably the first plaque, major plaque, that's been put up to remember these <coughs> hundreds of people who were tried, some of them executed or transported for these rural, these rural um, rebellions. Okay, so we went down there, and you know, it's in the guild hall now. It says it actually says in commemoration of the local men and women who, who appeared before this court as a result of the agricultural riots of 1830. This picture is even more interesting. This happened a little bit after. This is from um, somewhere in Middlesex, I think. And, um, oh, Hats, sorry, Hampshire, which is a county south of London. And what I like about this picture is they're celebrating a swing rioter who was executed, a guy called Henry Cook. And what he did was, he, well, we're not quite sure whether he did it, but a landowner came down to deal with a rioting mob of swing, you know, swing rioters that turned up. And um, a hammer was, or somebody tried to strike um, Lord Baring, okay? Baring, does that ring the bells, anyone? Yes. Yes. Baring. <laughs> Baring's Bank, yeah, one of the big merchant banks that probably did go out of business recently, I don't know. <laughs> no, I'm not crying about it. So Lord Baring comes down to his swing riders, Henry Cook apparently takes a swipe at him with a hammer, he kind of falls off his horse and knocks his hat on and stuff, and Henry Cook's executed for it. He didn't actually really hit him or anything, and he gets executed. And this group of people, of parishioners in this church, put this plaque up to celebrate Henry Cook. Okay? To say it was wrong that he was he was hung. This is this is kind of a big change, but a bit of understanding now about the swing. You know, but I, I laugh because of these parishioners are sitting here like supporting a riot in 1930. Okay. Now I'll try and draw this together now and shut up. <laughs> okay, so you go on to the next slide. Right, these are my thoughts about all of this, these four incidents and what's going on here, why, for example, Peter Lewis remembered, Tolpud is remembered, Swing is, is kind of not is a hidden history, and the Bristol 1831 riot is a distorted history in my opinion. First of all, this what I talked about previously is about the violence, the use of violence and non-violence. Peter Lewis, non-violent, Tolpud non-violent, Swing, violent, 1831, violent. Oh dear. Tick the boxes of Peter Lewis and Tolpud. Your propaganda purposes at the time, you can't tick the boxes rating 31 on Captain Swing. Right, secondly, formal organisation and spontaneous or spontaneity or spontaneous revolt. Very much stressed by the left about Peter Lewis as this organisation. What they don't stress is that organisation was a military organisation that was up for insurrection. Okay, but they stress the organisation, a proper movement, a political party in the making. Um, spontaneous events like 1831, the riots, or, or, or Captain Swing, just do not tick the right boxes, so we ignore them. Okay? Formal organisation applies to Tolpol because they were joining a trade union, a Methodist organisation. Regards to victims or insurgents, I mean, this relates to, to these times, you know. I mean, one of the, a lot of work's been done on Captain Swing over the last few years, and, you know, there's more and more evidence coming out that, that rioters, in, particularly in the, in the counties of Sussex and, and Kent, Marched around with tricolours, caps of liberty, caps of liberty. Most people in England don't know what that is, but you know they marched around. They, I mean, for example, in Kent, in Kent, um, you just had this revolution of 1830. You know, the liberty of people had just happened before that. The country was in kind of uproar about about these revolutions in Europe. I think Bel there was a revolution where Belgium had seceded from the Netherlands that year as well. So what's going on in Britain at the time is there's a big sort of either fear or or happiness about the fact that there's a revolution movement breaking out in France. For example, in Kent villages, rural labourers collect money for the victims of the revolution. I mean, what I mean is for the revolutionaries who were killed in Paris. Now, have a think about that, okay? 1830, I mean, 1830, there's like rural labourers collecting money in villages in Kent and giving it to French revolutionaries, okay? So when these riots happen, you do see an awful lot of influence of radical agitation. And um, I, mean, I won't go into detail of it, but all I can say to you is, is that there's a lot more to swing than meets the eye. Okay? It's, it's often been characterised as a bunch of starving rural labourers and that's it. But it was a lot more to it than meets the eye. It probably brought down the government. On November the 9th, 1830, Wellington's reactionary government collapsed and the Whigs took power. It was probably 
had a part to play um, in getting us democracy and reform, the first stages of democracy the year after the Reform Act. Um, so again, you know, the, these images of Peterloo, maybe they, they were insurgents. In swing, there was major politicisation, I would argue, and there were certainly attempts to politicise it, far beyond the demands of the rural labourers. And as we know, revolutions are not clean and tidy things. They're not organised by groups of people in reading rooms who suddenly decide to form a proletarian army and take over. You know, revolutions are un uncomfortable and you know, changing moments. And you know, as we know from the French Revolution, you know, the French Revolution has failed. They may have been dismissed as a bunch of rioters, like in 1831. They, they succeeded. So there's a lot more to these events than meets the eye, but those things are a little bit embarrassing for social democratic history, so they kind of obscure. The last thing I want to talk about is this thing called the two-sided, what I call the two-sided coin of modernity. That's a bit of a phrase, but uh, what I mean by that is, is that I would argue that there's kind of two ways of, or two strands of thought about particularly 19th century history which are, which are worth looking at. The first one worth understanding. The first one is kind of proto-capitalist, pro-capitalist, sort of Whiggist history in Britain, which kind of is what we call modernism, which says that, you know, that history proceeds through a whole series of, you know, kind of, um, changes, but they're all kind of progressive, and eventually you get to, you know, modern you know, representative democracy and capitalism, and that's great. And that's one side of it. And those histories particularly stress that you know, things like the peasant are backward, um, you know, rural revolts are backward, the introduction of machinery is progressive, and the reaction to it, like machine breaking, is backward. You know, and they, you know, they kind of definitely stress that. In fact, they pretty much ignore rural revolts altogether. But what they do have to deal with them, they basically say they're reactionary. So you get Luddite, you know, the word Luddite gets turned on its head. Um, the other side of this coin is classical Marxist history which I'd almost also suffers from similar problems because classical Marxist history, and I use the word classical in the sense that, um, I won't go into the details, but what I mean by that is the straightforward Marxist history is perhaps of the early 20th century. And they, what they say is, is that, you know, okay, we've got to go through this process from feudalism, socialism, eventually we get to communism, sorry, feudalism, <laughs> so, uh, feudalism capitalism, and then socialism and communism. So you know, go through this thing, and basically, if, if anything you're doing, if you're a peasant, you've got, you, you can't really, you know, you can't really, over, you can overthrow feudalism, you can't really do much else than that. You've got to be proletarianised before you can overthrow capitalism. You know, so there's all kind of like hurdles you've got to jump over. You know? So if you're a peasant, you can't, you can jump over the feudal hurdle. We can't jump over the capitalist hurdle. You've got to be proletarianised, you can jump over the capitalist hurdle. And, and that kind of is also a modernist history. And, and the problem with it is, is that it has difficulty then dealing with class struggle, which doesn't quite fit the model. Um, so sometimes it ignores it, and sometimes it kind of denigrates it. Uh, but to give credit to the British Marxists, or the classical historians, you know, or classical Marxist historians like you know, kind of early Thompson, Hobsbawm, you know, a lot of the people who are doing work, they did actually uncover a lot of this rural revolt, and they did un uncover it through their research because they were looking at history from below, and social history. The problem is, this is two-sided coin means that a lot of history is dominated by these two ideas, like this establishment history of like, you know, pro-capitalist history, or a classical Marxist history, which doesn't, you know, can't quite deal with a lot of this stuff. That's why I would argue that from both sides of the academy, whether it's the classical Marxist history or the, or the um, sort of Wiggins history, Things like Captain Swing have been ignored, um, and certain events like machine breaking as part of that are also ignored. So, for example, they often people often talk about rural labourers as peasants, but they weren't actually; they were proletarians, in fact. So, they, you know, there's a lot of misunderstandings about talking about swing rioters. There's also the problem of the lumpen as well, which I think Peter talks about quite a lot with the picaresque proletariat. The idea of London being, you know, this sort of section of the class that's not really integrated properly into work, you know, this is the discipline of capitalist labour. So therefore, what it does is kind of, at best, <coughs> irrelevant, at worst, reactionary. Okay, so it's a classical Marxist sort of problem. So a lot of things like 1831 riots are kind of seen as a bit lumpen, you know, not really, can't really deal with that, so we'll ignore that. And also, a lot of the tactics, the word I think Eric Hosborn uses quite a lot, a lot of the tactics of the, in these struggles, particularly in swing, also in 1831, also the Luddites sort of thing, are pre, they call pre-industrial. What pre-industrial means is that you do things like machine, great machines, you do collective bargaining by riot, you do that, that kind of tactics where communities like Steve's been talking about earlier on, that would be called pre-industrial. 
in Kingswood, that kind of rioting and moral economy, that kind of thing, those kind of protests. And, and so that often gets kind of denigrated. 